Okay, uh, so while we're, while we're waiting for everybody to get in, maybe we can uh, go through and do some introductions here. Um, my name is Dane Fredericks. I am the uh, Data and Training Administrator for Venture Portland. Um, so we've been hearing a lot about business interruption insurance and everyone's kind of realizing that they've been paying for this thing and their business is interrupted and um, they're not getting payout from their insurance company and they're kind of trying to figure out what's going on, why that is. Um, so to help us kind of wrap our heads around that, uh, we have Ben Cox. Um, ben is a plaintiff's attorney. Uh, as he put it to me, he um, sues insurance companies for a living, so he kind of knows how they work. And um, he's also been taking a look at what everybody is. Um, he's been taking a look at businesses insurance policies pro bono to just kind of let them know where they stand. Um, ben, what, uh, what have you been up to and what are you seeing out there? Sure. Um, so Dane invited me. Thank you very much, Dane. Um, and we know each other through uh, my work in the Williams Vancouver Business Association. Uh, so I have my own small business as an attorney and VP of that. Um, and I am a personal injury lawyer. So a lot of what I do involves suing insurance companies for wrongfully denied benefits. So I'm very uh, used to that. I train other lawyers on how to do that. Um, and I'm also pretty deeply involved with the Oregon Trial Lawyers Association and its legislative efforts, which um, kind of shows me like how things get done in Salem or don't get done. And that, that definitely has a dimension to the problem that we see uh, here. Um, as far, Dane, you want me to launch into it? I can launch into it as far as business interruption insurance. Um, um, well, let's, uh, let's, go, let's go through the introductions and then, and then get started on it. Okay. Um, we also are lucky to have Duran Beasley. Uh, Duran is a broker with Budget Insurance Enterprises. Uh, Duran, how long, how long have you been in the business? I've been in the insurance business for 11 years now. 11 years. Um, and kind of as I said, I got into insurance because I kind of felt like I got screwed over by an insurance company. So I wanted to see kind of what was the other side and be an advocate for my clients and be able to educate people on insurance as well. Great. And then uh, thank you also to Paul Stevens. Uh, Paul is the owner of the Night Light Lounge. He's been a small business owner for 11 years. Also a member of the Portland Independent Restaurant Association. Um, and he's working with them advocating a proposal to mandate coronavirus coverage for affected businesses um, for so that it would be covered under business interruption insurance. Paul, how are things in your industry? Um, they're, they're <laughs> we're surviving for now. Um, everybody's kind of in a waiting mode um, and trying to figure out what our industry will look like after all this is over. All right, so let's uh, let's kind of get into it. And I guess my first question, maybe Duran, you want to start us with this, is what does business interruption insurance cover? So business interruption insurance is generally going to cover what we consider covered perils. And a covered peril is something that is generally listed in your contract. Um, it's going to be a named peril in a lot of situations, meaning that it's going to actually be a fire. It's going to be possibly some sort of flood, something that's actually interrupting your business that's outside of your control and the control of pretty much anyone else. I know when we look at the, does, you know, the COVID and we, we do see it as a business interruption, but it's just very hard to quantify how much of your business is being interrupted because of that versus because of the other things that are going on surrounding the business. So from an insurance standpoint, I mean, it is not considered a, a peril. Um, and then, and then the other question, sort of the follow up question is why aren't businesses covered um, for this virus? Now, I mean, that's, that's a pretty complicated question and probably a little bit beyond my scope of, you know, 
professional, <laughs> but I can tell you generally the reason that it's not covered is because of the expense of it. I mean, when you look at what insurance does cover, insurance is there to try to make customers and clients whole. But if it, it you know, it just seems, I won't say unreasonable, but it, it's not probably possible to make everyone in the world whole through insurance alone. I mean, this is, it's a government function that the government is going to have to participate in. If insurance companies said, hey, look, we're going to cover every disease and everything that pops up out there. Well, none of us who are all in business would be able to afford the business insurance that we already do not enjoy paying for. It would skyrocket the prices of those insurances and make business possibly, I mean, in most cases, unlikely to be started by, especially small businesses. And, uh... And Ben, you've been looking at a lot of people's policies. Uh, as we mentioned, you've been making yourself available as a resource to businesses. Um, what have you been seeing out there? Sure. Um, so one of the first things I did is I went and pulled out my own policy to see uh, would I be covered for something like this and took a read through my commercial policy. And I quickly found the same exclusions that just about everybody else has probably encountered in their own policy. Um, as Duran's absolutely right, said uh, business interruption insurance is designed, despite the name of it, it's designed to really cover discrete events. It's supposed to, if you have a fire, if you have a pipe burst, if you have some temporary, um, what's called a direct physical loss to the property, uh, business interruption insurance is supposed to take care of you to some extent uh, while that is being repaired. It's not meant to be, um, something on the scale of, of you know, a, nat a national disaster or even a local disaster. Um, as Duran said, essentially insurance companies are in the business of insuring and spreading risk. And so the list of activities that they agree to insure has to be limited so that if there is something that wipes out everybody uh, that they are not wiped out in the same way and then can't reimburse anybody. Um, so business interruption insurance basically always uh, requires first what's called a direct physical loss. Um, there have been some, there is the creative argument that the presence of virus uh, itself can be a, a direct physical loss. There is, uh, I think at least one court has been okay with that one at one place in the country, uh, but it's, it's iffy. And then even if you have, even if that's a direct physical loss, how do you prove it? How do you prove that that your particular premises is actually uh, covered in virus um, that is making it unoccupiable. And really the reason you can't occupy your property is because the, uh, the governor has said that you can't um, more or less. And that's another exclusion in the policy uh, for government action. And that's gonna be in everybody's policy too. Um, beyond those two hurdles, if those weren't enough, um, is virus and bacteria exclusion. So the vast majority of, of policies, I've probably reviewed about 50 of them so far. Um, I'm, like Dane said, I'm reviewing them pro bono. If you want to send me yours, I'll take a look at them. It takes me very, very little time to look at them and find out if they have these terms in them. Um, but if they do have the terms, they're going to be enforceable against you. Um, so virus and bacteria exclusion, just about all recent commercial policies include that language. And what matters for an insurance contract is what was in place the day of the loss uh, that's the contract that they have to fulfill it's not it's not something that can be changed later um, except by agreement which as you might imagine they're going to just see anything as basically a, a nose under the tent and if one if they let one person slide on this then they're going to have to let thousands of other people slide um, so they're not going to do that. But in all those policies that I've seen or heard of, I personally haven't seen one that didn't have a valid exclusion and had to cover virus loss. I have heard of one. I'm going to list certain, uh, a thousand other uh, plaintiff's attorneys, and somebody uh, actually found one that did not have any language uh, that excluded these things. And so that insurance company presumably uh, will and should pay for the business interruption because they failed to exclude what 99% of the other policies exclude. 
Um, so Paul, you are in contact with a lot of, um, especially restaurateurs. Um, did you go through the process of trying to make a claim or, or having your business interrupted and trying and thinking that that would be covered by business interruption insurance? Yeah, I did make a claim immediately after the governor uh, closed all the restaurant dining rooms. Um, and I was excluded. Um, my claim, claim was denied due to the virus exemption, um, exclusion. And um, I think that they're reading those policies in one way. Um, I was not closed for a virus. I was closed by government mandate by civil authority, which there is a, a valid argument in my claim for. There's no appeal system with the insurance agency and there's no way of testing it um, on a private lawsuit basis just because small businesses don't have that kind of funding. Most of them can't afford a lawyer, much less a, a lawsuit. Um, and so the arguments that, that it's excluded um, is coming from one side. And I don't, um, I think that there's a, a fight to be had um, on the side of small businesses. I can add one bit of good news there, Paul. Um, so for every insurance policy in Oregon, if you file a suit on it and you win, uh, the other side has to pay your attorney's fees. Um, I, so all of my, basically all of my litigation against insurance companies, that's how I get paid is they have to pay me at my hourly rate for the work that I've done uh, on my client's behalf. Um, it's immensely pleasing for me to have the other company, to have the other side pay me for the pleasure of beating them. I like that a lot, um, but that law is there. And so if you do have a good claim, uh, there should be attorneys who would be willing to uh, look at that case seriously and think about, okay, is this something that we're reasonably likely to prevail upon? Um, because if you do have a decent enough chance, then they're gonna get paid in the end for all the work that they do to, to fight the insurance company over it. So that, that is an option, um, it's always there, and there's, um, that is the status quo on insurance policy litigation in Oregon. And, uh, I think that sort of brings up another question, which is, does the, and the, this is for, for everybody, does this emergency stay at home order have any bearing on policies and payouts? Um, you know, as Paul said, it is the governor that has him closing his business. Hard to say. It's very hard to say. I mean, I guess we're going to find out and, you know, this is kind of what we talked about yesterday. This is what litigation in America is all about. But I don't see, you know, I don't see that the insurance companies are going to pay out. I don't think that it would be good for business in the long run if, you know, all of a sudden your insurance policy is expected to cover all of your business in the event of something like this happening. Again, I, I would just see it as a factor that, I mean, if you know what your insurance costs you right now for your business, and Paul, you're in the nightclub business, you, you know that, you know, insurance is already expensive. It's already heavily underwritten. Could you imagine what the cost would be if all of a sudden insurance had to cover and, and now we're talking about a general liability policy had to cover your business, your business losses, your business expenses. I mean, this is, this is something to be thought of more kind of as, you know, when we go into this, this is universal health care. This is a little bit of everything. This is workers' comp. I mean, this is several different types of insurance that are built in this. I mean, I'm already having people who have asked me, hey, if my worker gets this virus, can they claim this as a workers' comp injury? Well, that's questionable. I mean, they might be able to. Of course, the insurance industry is going to deny that claim initially, but who's to say later on down the line that a court doesn't say, yes, this worker did go to their job and they got this virus because of their work, and so this becomes a workers' comp claim. I mean, again, I, I think we're going to see uh, an end to what we're seeing as far as the virus before we're going to see an end to all of the lawsuits and the laws that are going to change along the way because of this. I would raise the practical concern with Paul's uh, issue is that, as I said earlier, insurance companies, as you, I think you mentioned, civil authority is an exclusion um, in, the, in all policies, basically, if you're 
if you're told by the police or governor or any other act of government that you have to close your premises, then that isn't something they have to pay for. Um, if you did litigate over that, the, I mean, the practical problem is every insurance company would, is going to see a loss on, these, on any of these issues as an existential threat. If they become responsible for paying everybody's coronavirus-related business losses that they absolutely did not budget for or take premiums in to cover or whatever else, blah, blah, blah. They're going to fight it all the way. They're going to appeal. It's going to take forever. By the time you actually get anything done, your business and many other businesses will be out of business. Um, to me, the, the best practical option is probably not going to be um, through the courts. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that there's a real solution in the courts. I think it'll take too long and too many businesses will be out of business. I think you're right. Before there's any sort of resolution. And that's why we've been pushing for this on a legislative basis. And I think that um, I think that I understand the argument that the losses are going to be too large for even a well-funded in insurance industry to handle. And I think that that's, even though there's hundreds of billions of dollars, that's still not enough. And I, I think everyone recognizes that, but I don't think that that's an argument for not acting. And I think that in the same way that in 2008, the federal government underwrote large financial institutions, in normal business times, that would be completely unacceptable. And, um, but in extraordinary times to foreclose the financial collapse of the country, um, extraordinary actions were taken. And I think in this similar time that a legislative federal underwriting of the insurance industry or some solution on that level to allow the insurance agencies to be, insurance industry to be part of the solution uh, rather than fighting small businesses. Uh, the, only, the only real problem with that is that when you look at insurance as a whole, each state gets to determine what they want to do, their own rules for insurance. Each state has their own insurance commissioner. I mean, it, you're right. I mean, it, it would make more sense if we could do this on a national level, but insurance is not national by any means. Every state has different insurance laws, different insurance regulations, different policies that can be in effect, different ways that they want those policies underwritten. I mean, yes, it would it would make sense on a national level, but I mean, it's, it, it is currently not there. So your legislation would obviously have to start at a state level, but again, the insurance companies are huge. So they're not going to fight you fairly and they're not gonna fight on a state level. They're gonna again, take this and say, well, the, the state legislature of this state said that, but the state of this state legislature has already said that they're not doing that. So now we want to move this to a district court and then we want to move it to a bigger court. Now we're going to, I mean, again, it's the time. I think a better solution is yes, a grassroots movement for people to understand insurance, but also for there to be other things in place. I mean, we do have unemployment insurance, but we also need to have business co-ops. We also need to protect our small businesses by coming together. I mean, Portland is one of the great cities for small businesses. There are so many small restaurants. When I have friends that come into Portland, they're going, man, it's amazing. You guys don't have a bunch of McDonald's and Wendy's and everything else. Oh, we got all these nice ma and pa restaurants. Well, it's great for a while, but the problem is there's no coalition between them. Everybody's competing against each other. Nobody's, like you said, they're not creating these larger groups so that they can go out in a situation like this and possibly make a a change. Yeah, and that's why we've been pushing this on the state level is because there is a commissioner of insurance that you regulated on the state level. And I think if there's going to be action, it does need to start at the state level. Um, and it's the, the state's, uh, the commissioner of insurance's uh, duty to regulate insurance in the state and to, to take the, the good of the whole over the good of the, the few um, and to spread the the liability around um i think that it's a complicated issue but i do think it's important to be finding a, a a solution with the insurance industry in the same way that like the ppp is one avenue for help and the idle loans from the sba or is a second and an employment and it's going to take a lot of solutions to to save small businesses and um i think i just think this is one that, that, yeah, that could work. 
I mean, I think it's a valiant effort. And again, we, we do have to start somewhere. So I agree with the fight completely. I mean, you have to do it. I just don't know that, you know, in the short term, it helps. It may in the long term help in the future, but the short term is what I would also see some, you know, some things that we can do to help. And, you know, I think just being a part of a forum like this where we all understand that, hey, look, we do need to look and not just do the business with the big companies. We need to have the local function so that the people in the community can spend their money within their own communities. I mean, this is this is kind of going to be an important lesson that we learn from this. We get so many things from so many other places. And when we're not able to do that anymore, it just it completely changes the way that we look at everything. So whether it's we're talking about, you know, our meat system and, you know, right now the supply chain for this and no matter what it is we're looking at, we've got to look a little more locally and hopefully act a little more locally. And I think that is kind of what I think that's what you're saying here in one aspect. But you're also saying that, hey, look, we want to make sure that the government is also behind us and backing us. And I just don't know that our government currently is going to do that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I want to jump in real quick and just mention uh, Stephen Scardina from, I guess, the Oregon Restaurant uh, and Lodging Association mentioned a, a, a civil lawsuit uh, against the governor in the chat. So, um, you know, I'm not going to speak to uh, the merits of that, but, you know, it, it, there is a, a lot of different <clears throat> efforts going on from many different people, and it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, and you can you can all see that in the chat as well uh, if you want to check that out. Mm -hmm. um, I I think this sort of raises the question of how much money is there in insurance companies anyway. I know everyone pays a lot of money to their insurance company. They're massive multinational corporations. Is the money there? Well, there there's plenty of money. I mean, how much money is there? Is there? I mean, there's probably the insurance industry probably controls trillions of dollars. But let's also look at that as saying that that is also built into our infrastructure. That's built into a lot of projects that we do. They have to have cash reserves on hand to cover losses for a certain period of time. But I mean, there's not a, I mean, we don't have enough cash in America, honestly, to cover this, you know, for an extended amount of time. And so we're printing more money and we're making more money. But I mean, no, the insurance companies, do not have enough money to cover a virus or anything like this. I mean, we as people are going to have to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We may all wind up having to make some sacrifices, but I mean, this is a, this is a true national international event that is going to affect us all, as I've said, for the rest of our lives and probably our children's lives as well. And uh, Duran, you, you mentioned that this is going to take, government action. You also touched on um, that um, there's maybe not going to be effective government action just given the government that we have. Um, I wonder if anyone on the panel has thoughts about what that government action would look like, what some other sort of efforts to put pressure on people that can make changes, what, what that kind of pressure would look like. Well, I'm going to just start from, I'm just going to jump in real quick and just say that, you know, when I look at, I'm going to go into insurance, I'm going to vary a little, I'm going to go and just talk about auto insurance. And it, it's relevant kind of because when we look at auto insurance, I sell a lot of in, auto insurance in Oregon and people always ask me, well, why is my insurance so high? And the first thing I tell them is your credit score, your credit is bad. If you have bad credit in Oregon, they are allowed to charge you more for insurance. Well, what does my credit have to do with my insurance. Well, they've discovered that there are certain factors in there that say if you have bad credit, you're more likely to file a claim. I mean, there are, there are so many other factors. So when you look at it on a legislative basis, I think we have to make it fair. I mean, just to start with, insurance needs to be fair. You have huge corporations, multinational corporations that pay very little for insurance. And then you have some mom and pa businesses that pay a whole lot for insurance. And the reason why is because of what's allowed by the state. So every state, that insurance uh, commissioner that we spoke about earlier, they get to decide what are the rules? How is insurance charged for? What fees can be applied to it? You know, So on a legislative basis, 
you're going to have to start with a grassroots movement to say, let's just make insurance fair, period. I think that's, I think that's a great place to start. I don't know. Um, frankly, I don't think that insurance is going to be, the insurance industry is going to have much to do with any solution here. Um, I do, I absolutely agree that uh, Oregon should make changes to make, uh, to make insurance practice fairer, for example, we have an unlawful trade practices act that specifically excludes the in, in insurance industry. Uh, the Oregon Travelers Association and others have been trying to get that uh, law changed for a long time. Uh, most of the other states in the country have what's called bad faith law, which impl uh, puts in place real penalties for insurance companies that don't act in good faith uh, when they adjust claims. And I see it every day that in Oregon, it's in Washington, right across the river. The sky hasn't fallen. Premiums haven't gone up to a million dollars. They operate a just fine economy. They have strong bad faith law. And there is a measurable difference between insurance claims uh, behaviors in Washington claims versus Oregon claims. Clear as day. It's something we could do at any time. I have, um, and Ola's going to be working on that and keep working with other legislative partners to try and make it happen. Um, I have all the information on that. I have a one sheet about the Unlawful Trade Practices Act and testimony from small business owners uh, talking about how they got screwed uh, in their insurance laws and why the, the change could be good. Um, beyond that, though, I think the question that you're really here for is, you know, how can I save my business now? Um, I don't think that answer is going to be uh, in the insurance industry or in existing insurance policies. I think it's going to come working with other uh, already well-connected uh, political uh, lobbying groups, forming your own lobbying groups, banding together, offering pressure, constant pressure, and bringing real, uh, thinking through real solutions, bringing real solutions uh, to the legislature uh, that are politically palatable. Um, for the insurance industry, it has almost 40 full-time lobbyists in Salem. Um, at all times. That's, so that's our obstacle. Every year, uh, my organization is playing defense on all the bills that they're trying to move. They're bringing the same things up every year. It comes in as reliably as the tide and we have to beat it back every year, every session. Um, and then we play offense too. We try and uh, put forward bills that are favorable for consumers and businesses um, and they fight those. And so it's a constant, uh, very well-funded adversary. And to me, the solution here isn't to pick a fight uh, with an entity that large unless you think you can actually uh, win it. And I'm not sure that you can. The, the, the examples that Paul stated as far as what happened after the 2008 crisis makes sense with government backing, but what government was backing was new loans to these industries. It was not rearranging existing contractual obligations from before and essentially saying, oh, well, you actually you insured for this disaster the whole time, you just didn't know it. So you go ahead and pay them for that and then we'll pay you back. To me, I understand it's, it's, it's another strange, uh, crappy aspect of how we do things in this country where we just can't, we can't just give money to people. That would be the wrong thing. It has to go through this weird circuitous way where we're not actually helping anybody. We're assisting business and helping someone else. Um, but, in this example, if you think through the logistics of having the insurance company take the lead on this, that means you're essentially constrict, uh, conscripting their entire adjusting teams into, well, now you have to figure out how to adjust, you know, a thousand or 2000 uh, business interruption cases that you didn't know existed. And you have to go figure out the merits of all those claims. It just causes all these cascading problems when the easier route that isn't easy, but it's easier, uh, is to find some other solution that the legislature uh, will find palatable politically um, for relief to business owners uh, and their employees. I, I, I just think that like the insurance industry does have the infrastructure in do, they have adjusters, they have claim systems, they, they write checks every day. And in the same way that the banks were kind of partially conscripted and partly paid to administer the PPP loans, the insurance agency has the infrastructure to do it. And 
as we've seen, like the SBA is completely overwhelmed. The PPP is completely overwhelmed. And what we need is more avenues. Um, I do understand like the industry that has, <laughs> I didn't know there was 40 lobbyists, but they have a lot of money and they have a lot of influence and a lot of campaign contributions. But I do believe that where the people lead, the legislature will follow. And I think that if there's enough public outcry for it and enough understanding of the needs for small businesses, that, that there, where there's a will, there's a way. And we'll find a way to do it. Um, ultimately, the insurance industry needs businesses as much as the businesses need the insurance. And if there is no, <laughs> if an entire swath of small businesses is wiped out by this crisis, then um, they're not going to have clients to. <laughs> right. so. Let me let, let me kind of jump in there a little bit. And you're correct on some of that. But let's also face it that the insurance industry's job is to deny, delay, defend. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. They're going to deny your claim, as you already found out. They're going to delay you because you think at this point that there is nothing else that you can do to go back and challenge that. But there are things you can do to challenge that. And then they're going to defend their position on this. And that's what they're going to do. Um, at the end of the day, it's a business. And they're here to make money. And they've been making money for hundreds of years doing this. And they're not going to give that up very easily to anyone. And you have to keep that in mind. I mean, it, it, the people that are making the money in this country are making their money with insurance. And a lot of them are not going to be willing to give it up. It is, at the end of the day, it's still generally a private business. I mean, you've got mutual companies out here that are, you know, they're for their companies, but the rest of these, they're publicly traded companies. And again, when you start looking at telling any company what they can do, just like the companies are now being told, they don't want to be told to, that they have to shut down. Anytime you tell somebody what they have to do with their own checkbook in their own industry is going to create a very big problem that they are going to fight vigorously because just like you're fighting for your business life, they are figure they're also fighting for their business life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, they are a very well regulated industry. They're constantly being told what they can and can't do. Um, and ultimately the government does Trump like after everything and all the money and all of that, like the government has the ability and the right and the responsibility to regulate the insurance industry. And I think it's a hard fight, but I don't think that it's. No, you're correct. You're absolutely correct. And they, and they do regulate the insurance industry vigorously. As a matter of fact, if you want to talk about that, I mean, if you look at laws and what goes on in the insurance industry, there's two places you can always look. You can look to California and you can look to New York. Those are the places where anything that's going to happen within the insurance industry are going to start out with. Why? Because they're just huge places. New York has their own insurance system that is different than any place else in the world. California has more people that are insured than any place else. So if you're looking at anything to see what's going to happen, those are the two states that are generally going to be the places where anything's going to start at. It's, it's you know, I mean, Oregon's got a few million people. It's It's just... It's so hard. And, I, and again, I, I understand. I want you to pursue it. But I think pursuing it with the reality that, you know, it may not be successful, but that doesn't stop me from trying. Yeah. I may not win the marathon, but I want to run the marathon to compete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and I, I do think that California, New York will definitely lead the way. Um, but I think that we can offer our support and we can um, explore options here and push for it here um, so that, yeah, I think it's worth the fight. No, exactly. You got, you, if, you don't, if you don't buy a lottery ticket, you can't win the lottery. So you're, just look at it as you're buying a ticket, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> similar odds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, one thing that I found compelling about Paul's proposal, or important independent restaurant association proposal, um, is it has a real mass popular appeal. You know, there's a, there's a real constituency there of people that, um, that correctly identify that they, there's a lot of money out there and it's not in their pockets. Um, so, you know, I, I think that does raise the possibility of these more popular movements that, uh, you know, change the paradigm and, and change what's possible 
Um, so I, I guess my question for all, for everyone on the panel is, um, what happens next? You know, how is this going to affect the business landscape? It's re reopen. Uh, who's going to still be around? And and are we looking at any big paradigmatic shifts, especially in the insurance industry? That's, oh, go ahead. I'll let anyone else answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, honestly, I, I wrote down something last night when you sent me those questions. And, and when it came to that, my answer was wild, wild west. I mean, it really is the wild, wild west right now. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think anyone can give you an answer on where is this all going to go? Because it's someplace we've never been before. This is, this is just totally new territory. And we can all give our opinions, and that's all that they are. But at the end of the day... I think our solution is, yes, to continue to the fight with the legislature. But again, I mean, it's grassroots. It's got to be the communities coming together. I mean, it really has to be that. If we're going to all get through this together, we've got to put our hands together. And that doesn't necessarily, I mean, I understand the social distancing, so I'm not saying we got to come and, but we have to help one another give each other a leg up. And whether that's the landlords, you know, hey, maybe this is what my mortgage is. So I, I'm not going to take my profit this month and I'm going to help you stay in this place to, you know, my neighbor needs some help with something and maybe I've got a little bit of extra money and some extra food. So I'm going to make sure that they get it. It really, if we're going to get through this, then we've got to all do this together. And as much as, you know, our government is a great government, the United States is a great system. At the end of the day, it is for the people, by the people. And we, we are the people. Yeah, I agree. A lot of the people, like, where I've seen the most positive action and most responses with working with, like, the PIRA and um, the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association, Oregon Distillers Guild, the Brewers Guild, groups that are working, that represent larger business groups, um, lots of businesses, and um, they're advocating for all of us and um, working with the legislature to try and shape how the health department rules look and how on this issue, um, I think that right now we're all, I, I think of it as like a parabolic flight, you know, the weightless planes and we're all kind of weightless at the moment. The, um, the consequences of this are not being felt. Like there's no evictions, there's no rent, like loans are all put on hold and we're all kind of floating. And I think as we start talking about reopening, um, that's when gravity is gonna kick back in. And there's gonna be a lot of people who land on their feet and will be stronger than they were before. But I think there's gonna be huge swaths hundreds thousands of businesses that we're going to close um because they yeah. didn't have the tools that they had before like that they needed to succeed um whether or not they were healthy before um and i'm afraid you're exactly right about that and i think that is a good metaphor it feels like you know when you see you knocked a glass off the off the table and you see it on the way down to the ground that that sort of feeling we're in the middle of it and it's mm -hmm. uh what this is going to look like as the shock waves uh, start hitting and, uh, and secondary waves start coming in and it starts looking like the damn depression out there. Yeah. Um, we're going to find out what people are willing to do collectively, politically, um, to sort of uh, seize the tools of government to uh, do what we can for each other uh, at a government level. It's going to be uh, quite a process, let's put it that way. Yeah, one of my concerns about delaying this fight or, um, or I think why it's important to be fighting for business insurance now is because it's going to be a long process. Even if everybody decided today that, all right, this is how we're going to work together, it's going to be months before any checks go out as those systems are developed. And um, I don't want it to be too late when we start trying to figure this out and try helping people. So I'm going to talk, um, I'm Miranda, I own um, Memento on Hawthorne and 37th, and um, I've been in my store, not open to the public, but working four days a week and doing, you know, pretty much all I can without my two employees who are luckily, they just both got on uh, unemployment, um, I'm not eligible, but, um, but I'm kind of also wondering about, um, 
with insurance companies, if you're actively working in your store, are you even, would they take that against you? You know, you're, while you're in there and you're working, you know, so. No, or is that no, I mean, not your insurance, your insurance is still in place. I mean, as long as you paid your premiums and currently in Oregon right no. now, they're not even allowing them to cancel policies for non-payment. So even if you haven't paid your premiums, no, your insurance policy is still in force. It's still in effect. The problem is it doesn't cover you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it, if your place burns down, it'll, right. it, you know, I mean, if your building burns down, then not yeah. giving you any ideas. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> hey, uh, no, of course not. But I mean, it, the, the insurance is still there. The insurance is still in place. I mean, I, I'm more worried about, okay, so now you've got people who are laid off and I also sell a good clip of health insurance. Well, your health insurance follows you for about 30 days. Well, after that, if you're laid off, you're, you now you've been activated, you're Cobra and Cobra is expensive generally for most people. So when we're looking, yeah. you know, 30, 60, 90 days down the line at a virus that could actively get you after your insurance is canceled. I mean, there's, there's some real problems that we haven't even started addressing or talking about at all. I mean, there's, there's more to come. Yeah. So yes, your insurance for your building is still in place. Hopefully you're continuing to pay, you know, your health care. Yeah. But I mean, your yeah. employees, you know, it's, it's, it is still, the, it's going to be the wild, wild west. Like I said, I don't know where all this is going to land. And I'm hoping, you know, my business is around at the end of this as well. But, you know, it, it is kind of, this is where we are. And go for it, Ben. Uh, just to answer uh, Jacob's question in the chat, he asked if a business survives the pandemic and wants to renegotiate a new insurance policy, are there things they, they should consider? And the answer to that is that commercial policies that basically everybody has are take it or leave it, off the rack products. They're not there for negotiation. Um, so I would say don't worry about that. It's, yeah. a, it's the same as auto. You can't really negotiate the terms mm. of the auto policy beyond the policy limits uh, that you want to pay for. Yeah, you can change some of the coverages. You can have amendments to certain parts of the policy, but no. Fundamentally, insurance is not a negotiation. It's a contract, and you either sign it and take it, or you don't. Yeah, so with that, let's um, let's kind of open up the floor, and, and uh, if anyone has any other questions, um, drop them in the chat, or if you, if you want to talk, just uh, I, think, I think you can message me or raise your hand or say it in the chat, and I'll... I'll make sure you're unmuted. Um, does anybody have anything uh, pressing on their minds? <laughs> so uh, Brian says, I tried to get my agent to lower my auto insurance since no one is on the roads. Uh, they said park it, which I'm guessing it's, is a euphemism. <laughs> the smart well, insurance companies have, have been giving rebates to people. Um, it, that's, just, just good business, it seems like to me. Very easy goodwill to get, uh, but not all of them have been doing it, as you've seen. Most of the insurance companies are rebating, but the rebates are yeah. for uh, May and June. So you'll see those monies coming back in May and June. And the amounts that you're receiving back are generally between 15 and 20% of what your monthly premium would be. And they're not necessarily mm -hmm. sending out checks to people. Some of them, they're actually, if you pay your bill with a credit card or you pay it through your checking account, you may have to check those accounts because they're actually just going to redeposit that money right back into some of those accounts. And again, it, this is not about the insurance companies loving you so much that they want to do the right thing. This has got, this has to do basically with the fact that insurance is only allowed to make a certain amount of money. Insurance companies are not allowed to gouge you for prices. So if they are making good money and they can run their business very well, they are required to lower their rates. So the better company that you're with, the lower the risk of their of their clients, the less your rates are going to be. And if your rates are less, you're probably going to get less back. But no matter what, at the end of the day, there is some relief coming. But it's it's not enough to you know to worry about for sure. Um, uh, Stephen, I, I saw that you. Uh, came up in the chat a few times talking about the Res Oregon Restaurant Lodging Association. Um, are you, would you care to uh, kind of speak to what you know about those efforts? Yeah, feel free to say no, I know. Uh, you, <laughs> well, as far as I know, every, you know, 
legislature is not in session right now, so it's it's still stalled out at the national level. But we do have legislators that are willing to take this up in legislation that we are pushing and working really hard to you know get this going. So that with just getting the state open, I don't know. I was on the uh, press conference with the governor uh, with the opening of Oregon. Uh, prior to this, and uh, it's going to be a slow process. So we're certainly busy at the statewide level, just doing what we can to make sure that we can speed up this process, help businesses, you know, lower the curve and get the counties to get them to reopen quicker, faster. But according to our governor, um, it's not going to happen quickly, though. Um, any other questions before we uh, call it a day? No. Well, uh, I want to thank our panels for coming. Um, I know they have other important things to work on, so I appreciate them making time. Uh, ben, is there anything you want to plug or anything that people ought to know before we sign off? No, thank you very much for letting me be here and good luck to everybody. If anybody has any questions about insurance stuff ever, happy to handle that, um, no charge or anything, just uh, just contact me. Uh, ben Cox, I'm up on North Williams. Um, I used to say across from Tasty and Sons, but now I say across from the uh, conveyor sushi place. <laughs> uh, Duran Beasley, great to have you. Um, really appreciated your perspective. Is there anything we ought to know or anything you'd like to plug? Nope, well, same thing. Uh, my business is located on 82nd and Broadway. If you have any questions, you can definitely feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, I'm sure if anybody needs anything, they can get my information from you as well. So no, if you have any questions or if there's anything else I can help you with with insurance, also feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Great, thank you for your time. And uh, Paul Stevens, you uh, are quite busy right now. Uh, doing stuff with Nightlight. Thank you for your time. Is there anything that you uh, would like to plug or mention that we should know about? Um, yeah, I mean, we're starting to open up for to-go and for takeout again. Um, so that's, if you want to stop by, we're at Southeast 21st in Clinton. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate the, the ability to talk about this. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, as Jacob mentioned in the chat, we'll Thanks, send, uh, we'll send follow-up information, uh, panel's contact information, and then uh, assuming oh, there's no technical glitches, we will uh, we'll upload a video so you can reference things back as needed. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Be Good safe. to see everyone.